Hello, I'm Jim Rondo from the Canadian Company of Pilgrims, Victoria Chapter. Today we're interviewing the Reverend Sandy Brown, who is currently on a Camino in France. Uh, we're going to talk about his vast experiences walking over 12,000 kilometers on multiple Caminos, and we're also going to talk about his guidebooks, where he's got a guidebook that you could download and use on your Camino. I hope you enjoy the interview. Sandy Brown, uh, an author, a reverend, and an avid walker. And so we're pleased to have you here. And right now, where are you? And can you tell people about yourself a bit? Hi, Jim. I'm here in Rheim, France. And if you don't, if that doesn't sound familiar to you, it's spelled R-E-I-M-S. And among other things, it has one of the most beautiful cathedrals here in France. And I'm in the process of writing the first volume of the Via Francigena series. I've already completed volumes two and three. Now I'm doing the part of the Via Francigena between Canterbury and Lausanne. So as you said, I'm a pastor retired United Methodist minister in Canada that would be part of the United Church. And uh, I have been walking every vacation since about 2008 after being inspired by Paulo Coelho's book, The Pilgrimage. I walked the Camino de Santiago. And since then, I've walked about 12,000 kilometers in Spain, France, Switzerland, and Italy. I started writing guidebooks in 2014, and I'm on my fifth and sixth guidebooks right now. And I really love helping people to discover these great pilgrimage walks. I can't believe, I thought we did a lot of walking when we've done six uh, walks. I, when I saw how many walks and how many kilometers you were, you are truly inspirational. And uh, I'm just trying to figure out what inspired you to walk in the first place. Well, as I alluded to, I read The Pilgrimage by Paulo Coelho. And what fascinated me about that was the idea of walking in Spain. Because my family has some roots in Spain that we're continually trying to uncover. And I thought, what better way to connect with, with the country where some of my ancestors came from than to walk? And it sounded like a great adventure. And uh, so I, I read the book, The Pilgrimage, in 1992, but I didn't get to the Camino de Santiago until 2008. So uh, everybody that's ever walked the Camino probably has a story like that, where you set your goal, but it takes some years to be able to arrange your life so that you can meet that goal. In my case, it was 16 years. But once I did it once, I was hooked and I wanted to go back and back over and over again. Well, uh, I, I, uh, you truly inspire me. You're amazing. Uh, and you've also taken the time to write books. And that many people have done blogs, but you've done books. Can you talk about the names of the books? And can you talk yeah. a little bit about what your books are all about? Sure. My books are all guidebooks. And I work with Cicero Press, which is one of the largest English language guidebook makers for outdoors. And... Um, so what happened was I was walking the Camino del Norte and I realized there was not a very good, or actually at the time, there was no English language guidebook. So I picked up the French language guidebook to the del Norte and I used a website that had the Spanish language guidebook and I put those two together and I thought, wow, this really needs a guidebook. 
And so I began to look around for who would be willing to publish that. I contacted Cicero and Press. They said, oh, as it turns out, we actually already have a guidebook in the works for that. And the next year, I walked the Way of St. Francis in Italy. I loved it. And so then I proposed to Cicero and Press that I would write a guidebook on that walk, which I did. That was my first book. They asked me to write the new Cicero and Guidebook on the Camino Frances, which was published in 2020. And I asked them, if I'm going to do the Frances Guidebook, I'd like to do one that I would really love to see a new guidebook for, which is the Via Francigena. So we agreed that would be in three volumes. And that's what I've been working on since about uh, 2017. So I, I got into it because I was a walker and I wanted walkers who speak English to have good guidebooks like the French and the German and the Spanish do. So that's what got me started. So, and how would uh -huh. it differ from other guidebooks? Well, we are instituting a new pilgrimage guidebook format. And the Del Norte book is not in that format yet. The first of the new series is the Camino Frances book. And that's, that was published in 2020. So everything after 2020 will be in the same format. And the most important things are, first of all, on accommodations. So every accommodation will have 22 different fields of information that will help pilgrims be able to decide if they want to stay at that particular accommodation. So, for instance, we could tell you if you could use a credit card. We'll tell you if there is a disability accessibility, if there is a communal dinner, if breakfast is served, if there is dormitory sleeping or private rooms and many other things like that and so that's one example of how we're going the next mile and also we're making sure that our maps are to scale so some of the most famous guidebooks out there don't use actual to scale maps they're drawings or representations of what the route is and at Ciceron we felt that it's important to have the actual map. And plus, our maps always face north up. So you always know where you're at in comparison to the cardinal directions. Then um, we always have an appendix at the end, which is a table that shows your distances between places where there's accommodations. So you don't end up at somebody else's stage end and discover that all of the accommodations are booked. Instead, you can design your own stages very easily with that. We call it Appendix A. So those are just some of the ways in which uh, we are changing and, in my opinion, updating uh, the idea of a Pilgrim Branch guidebook and really making it state-of-the-art and next generation. Well, I, I can tell you as a walker who used the German book and the uh, English language book, The First Pilgrimage, where we were looking for some material from one place and some material from the others, I appreciate the way you're approaching your guidebooks. Good, good. Thank you. One thing I like about the German guidebooks is that they will tell you where a laundromat is. Yes. And at one point I thought there was just too much detail, but no, it's actually something that you can really use. So we included that in the data of ours. Nowadays, albergues oftentimes have washing machines themselves. Yes. So we list that among the 22 different data fields for each albergue, and it was inspired by the Germans. <laughs> Thank you. How would you approach the walk? You started the first walk in 2008, and you approached it a certain way. You've done multiple, multiple walks. How has your approach to the walk changed over all those years? Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, first of all, I would say that there is an aspect of my preparations that is different now. So the first time I walked, I think by about the end of the second week, I had about 12 big blisters on my feet. And uh, it took me a few years to find a system that works for me. And I moved from hiking shoes to hiking boots to hiking sandals and now to trail runners as, uh, you know, what I put on my feet. And that's actually, uh, I, I think that shows in a way the evolution of my own thinking. I've changed from seeing it as a hike to seeing a pilgrimage as uh as something of an ordeal that I have to master for my own well-being. So I know what I need. I know that after three or four days, if it's been hot, I need to go to the pharmacy and get some magnesium potassium so that I can recoup those minerals that I've lost. So in the preparations and the uh, way in which I'm dealing with my body, those are things I'm better at. In terms of what happens to me on the walk, I'm used to this now. And so I remember sitting on the Camino Frances at the heights above Lagronio and Viana and writing my journal about what it was like to be by myself. And it was unusual. I mean, a pastor is oftentimes with people and very much in a communal arrangement. But I was experiencing solitude and I had to learn how to deal with that. On the front says, solitude is unusual. But on the Del Norte or the San Andres or the Via Francigena or the Via di Francesco, Solitude is routine. So even today, as I was making, today I was on a bike. I was doing three walking stages on a bike because I already covered these earlier this summer and I just wanted to refresh myself. I, I stopped and I was in a vast field that had already been harvested. And I could see for probably two or three miles in many directions. And that moment of simplicity and beauty is what makes me want to come back every single time. Because it speaks to my soul. So I didn't know that that's what it was in my first Camino. But... I know that now, and when it, and when I fall into it on a stage, and I find myself just in a sort of an ecstasy as I experience nature and the vastness of the world around me, uh, it's not a discovery anymore. It's an old friend, and it's a welcome moment where I can stop and feel as though I'm being fed and nourished. So those are two ways that I'm different now. Uh, so talk to us uh, about what the average walk you walk each day and what, how you approach each day and what you expect each day. So... Uh, that's different when I'm walking the Camino Frances or if I'm walking a less busy uh, pilgrimage with less infrastructure. So at the start of the day now, my most important, um, my most important goals are to find water and to find food that will last me for the day. So it just happens in the French region when you're in France. You may or may not come upon a village where there is a bakery or a restaurant. In fact, almost always you don't. And your next food is at the stage end. 
in France, what's really great is that there are these bakeries and bakeries are in most every uh, small to medium sized town. They make not just baguettes and sweet treats, but they'll also make you a sandwich. So I get my water, I get my sandwich for my lunch so that I have enough food to make it through the day. I'm always uh, just doing a liter and a half. That's what works for me, a liter and a half of water. Uh, and I set out. I'm very careful about what's in my pack. I usually carry an iPad with me, but um, the last couple times I had it with me, I just felt my pack was too heavy. So I don't have my iPad with me, just a big camera, which is my only uh, luxury, really. But I need that for great photographs that will go into the guidebook. So I get my water and my food. And then I already have loaded the GPS tracks onto my phone. So I open my phone when I step out the door. And I turn on my GPS and I follow the line through the day. Or if I feel like um, the line isn't making sense to me, then I make my own line. So as an example, here in France, there are all these canals. And the canals usually have roads on either side. And they're very straight. Well, the Franchitina sometimes runs out and goes into the woods and climbs a mountain and then comes back to the next city. Well, if the canal connects the two cities, then and it saves me five kilometers, I'll probably take the canal road. So I'm um, not just blindly following the route on my GPS, but I'm also looking for the best options. I'm looking for photographs all the time, because I think what makes a, a book great, other than the descriptions and the information, is photographs that are really compelling. Every town I go to, I'm looking for the great photograph. And um, that's a part of guidebook writing that is underappreciated. And when you see good photographs in a guidebook, then uh, that's a very, very good thing. I really respect that. So a guidebook writer needs to be able to write, needs to be able to handle lots of data, needs to be able to handle things like a GPS and so on, and then should have an artistic bent that allows them to do really high quality photographs. Excellent. And so on, a, on a different routes, would you book your accommodations ahead of time? And what sort of accommodations do you look for? Well, it all depends on the route. Now, the last time I did the Camino Francaise, I did not book my accommodations ahead until I got to Osobrero. And at Osobrero, uh, I couldn't find a good place. I ended up with my, my wife, which was great, in the municipal albergue at Osobrero, which probably has 150 beds. I forget the number. I usually don't like to sleep in big dormitories. Um, and so nowadays on the Francais, I look for smaller private albergues. And if I'm with my wife, I want to have a private room. If I'm by myself, I'm okay with a dormitory room of six to 10 or 12 people. But I don't like the big 100 bed dormitories so much. It just seems a little too random and a little too busy in the middle of the night. So uh, I look for hostels. I'm always very budget conscious. But in the big cities, I almost always get a hotel because I want to have a shower to myself. I want to go to the laundromat. I want to, if I want to, I want to soak in the tub and... Um, I want good Wi-Fi, I want some privacy also. So that's really my pattern, a hostel when I can find one and a hotel in the uh, larger cities. I usually book no more than about three or four nights ahead. So I have day off tomorrow and I'm gonna be planning my next week 
And the accommodations are kind of a challenge on the Via Francigena in France. So I will plan ahead my accommodations for five or six days. And then every night I'll look ahead to the, uh, to the fifth or sixth day beyond. I don't like to um, book accommodations much more than that because I want to retain my flexibility. So would that be the same on all routes? On the Francis, you can be more, um, uh, you know, more serendipitous, really, and just walk as long as you want to. My theory is don't book your entire pilgrimage ahead, even though you might be worried about getting a bed. Just book five or six days at the most because you want to have some flexibility. Um, let's talk about budget. Uh, how much money do you do people need and how much money do you spend? It's really different on the various different Caminos. So on the Francis, I feel it's pretty easy to get by with about 40 to 50 euros a day. You can find accommodation usually for in the range of about 20 euros or less, depending on how picky you are about what the room is like. If you're in a large dormitory in a municipal and then there are meals available for say 10 to 12 euros for a menu del peregrino. And um, so then it's lunch and breakfast besides that. So 40 to 50 euros is really doable in the Francais. On the Francicina, it's really different. So in France, it's nice to be able to stay in a gîte. And a gîte is oftentimes somebody's home where they've opened up a few bedrooms, or it's sort of like a bed and breakfast. In some cases, there are dormitory rooms, but oftentimes the host will offer demi-pension or half board. And then it's not uncommon with your overnight your breakfast and your dinner to be in the range of about 60 to 70 euros a night. So um, on the French region, that's probably a good amount to plan. There's also more camping available on the French region. So oftentimes in France, people will bring their tent, especially if they want to save some money on the long days. Basically it's 1100 kilometers in France. So that's um, between 30 and 40 days. And at 70 euros a night, that's a lot of money. Yeah, we have a budget usually, uh, because two of us are walking, we have a budget of about 40 to 60 euros a day. And mm -hmm. we find that, but we- Each or together. To, uh, together, but we do that because we make our own, we cook our own meals. You're way more of a pilgrim than me because by the end of the day, and I usually do 30 to 35 kilometer days. It's not uncommon for me, but I want somebody to bring my dinner to me. <laughs> <laughs> so. you know, and, and in France, uh, because the food is exceptional, especially uh -huh. the food is so exceptional, sometimes it's worth it to have a, a very fancy pilgrimage versus budget conscious pilgrimage. Um, so okay. can you tell us some highlights about some of the walks that you've done? And that's a very open yeah. question. Sure is. But I, immediately some come to mind and oftentimes they're in the mountains. So one of the reasons that I like the Via Francigena so much is crossing the great St. Bernard Pass. So St. Bernard, everybody knows the dogs. Well, sure enough, the dogs were bred in order to help travelers over the mountain pass that now bears the name of the saint, Bernard, who a thousand years ago established a hospice at the top. And then hundreds of years later, they started using St. Bernard dogs for rescue. But I'll tell you, the three or four days 
leading up to uh, summiting the Great St. Bernard Pass, which is 2,400 meters, about 8,400 feet, is pristine, beautiful walking. And then you get to the pass, and here are uh, jagged granite peaks and a lake. You're standing in Switzerland. You can see, you know, 100 yards away to Italy, and it's just spectacular. Then the next day down, actually the next four or five days are also through the mountains. And oftentimes there are just beautiful uh, forests and mountains. Uh, and Italy has all kinds of castles. You probably go by eight or 10 castles over the next uh, seven or eight days. So those are two of the really outstanding and wonderful things I see on the French Egypt. On the Francaise, I think, uh, you know, the Meseta doesn't get good enough uh, reviews. But when I talk about that moment with nature, an example of that is after Castro Herriz, when you go up to the height uh, where you look down on the valley toward Itero de la Vega, you can see, I'm sure, 10 to 15 miles. And it's a patchwork of farms. It's really spectacular. You also get that experience at Osaburo after uh, you're starting your way down toward Tria Castilla. And it's just beautiful to be in the mountain areas like that. Everybody loves Finisterre. Everybody loves Mushia. But what about the quiet beaches between Finisterre and Mushia? I encourage people to take that walk. There's a lot to see and uh, take some extra time so you can walk the 20 minutes or so to one of the great exclusive, I guess you could say, uh, small beaches where nobody else goes. You're almost certain to be all by yourself. And uh, you can enjoy the crashing of the waves there. Okay. So those are some of the great places I've seen. So uh, in the final question, uh, Sandy, did you ever have any language difficulties while you were traveling? <laughs> I have language difficulties every single day. <laughs> but... To me, that's part of the fun. So um, I'm also working on a guidebook in California. And it's really fun to see the difference between being in a place where you speak the language and being in a place where sometimes you don't really know what's going on around you. And so between French, Spanish, and Italian, I can usually uh, come up with my own romance language words uh, based on one of those three that make absolutely no sense to anybody. But the average pilgrim has something that I didn't have when I started in 2008, and that is Google Translate. <laughs> so uh, get the app, it's free, and you can even download the Italian, Spanish, French dictionaries, so you don't need a cell connection to make um, translations for you. And uh, then you can speak into it. You don't even need to type it. It will think for a minute, and then it will give you the translation. When you turn it around, it's big enough for the person on the other side of the counter to be able to read. So I don't think there's much excuse anymore for people not being able to be understood. Excellent. But I, I also believe it really is out of respect that still a person should learn as much as they can of the language before they go. And that earns affection and respect. So I think it's still important for people to try to learn some and then use Google Translate when you get in trouble. C'est bon, c'est merveilleux. So can you tell us a little bit about the best alberg that you've ever stayed in and specifically one on the way of St. Francis? 
Oh, well, on the way of St. Francis, my favorite place to stay is a place called Locanda Francescana in Poggio Bastone. And there is the owner, it's a private place. The owner's name is Feliciano. And he takes great care of the pilgrims that come through. But what I like best is that at the restaurant where he serves the pilgrims, his mother is the cook. So we get to meet his mother, have some real local Italian food, and have a fun, friendly visit with Feliciano. Excellent. Is there another uh, alberg that really comes to mind when you say the best alberg that you've been in? Oh, my favorite alberg of any Camino is the uh, San, San Nicola at Ponte Ficero uh, on the Camino Frances. Now, that's the alberg that's in the old Pilgrim Hospital, and it's run by the Italian Confraternity. Uh, they only have about 30 people a night that can stay there and they wash your feet and say a prayer and then, uh, cook you a spaghetti dinner and have a wine drinking competition. So between those things, uh, it just is the funnest atmosphere and the most, um, the most sort of intimate and loving place to be in the communal meal, the foot washing, and the fun that you have in that little remote location. Okay, excellent. Which route is mostly done on backcountry roads or trails? I would say that um, of the routes that I have done, both the Via Francigena and the Via di Francesco are mostly on backcountry roads and trails. So France and Italy seem to have more backcountry roads than places like the United States. Um, in Spain, there also are, the funny thing about the uh, Camino Frances is that the roads feel like they're pedestrian walkways. They stop feeling like country roads and they're really, uh, they're made for lots and lots of pilgrims to be able to cross. So I would have to say the Francigena and the Francesco are the ones that are most like that. Uh, the next question is uh, rather funny. If one can speak Spanish, can you get heard in Italy when you speak a little bit louder with more hand gestures, or do you actually have to learn Italian? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. You know, the, the before I learned any Italian at all, I... Uh, used my Spanish, and I was surprised how much was understood. When I took Italian classes, there was a priest from Argentina who came in in the third week, and by about the second day, he was already better at Italian than I was after two weeks. So you definitely have a leg up in Italy if you have strong Spanish. And if you're a native Spanish speaker, you'll intrinsically uh, be able to make sense of a lot of Italian. And the, the same is true the other way. So as far as the loudness of voice, I'm not sure that's helpful. But I know that in Italy, the gestures are helpful because that's how much of their speaking happens too. Yes. Uh... I have an Italian friend that I told them that if we ever tied their hands together, they couldn't speak. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so if people want to buy your guidebooks or see them, how would they get access to them? Well, it's very easy to do on Amazon. And I guess Amazon in Canada is Amazon.ca, right? Yes. Okay, so you can go and get them on Amazon. As it turns out, Amazon is not that good at um, making the most of uh, the best contribution to authors or publishers. So we actually prefer that people go to the Cicerone Press website, which is Cicerone, C I C E R O N E dot C O dot U K. 
And Cicerone for five pounds will send a guidebook anywhere in the world. So, um, and also the author gets full compensation for the guidebook as well. Um, because Amazon does such bulk buying and enforces such low prices that we make almost no money by selling a book on Amazon. But you can buy it there. You can buy it on Cicerone website. And something to remember, too, is uh, with a great publisher like Cicerone Press, you can buy an electronic version. So we sell four different electronic versions, including EPUB and Kindle. And if you don't want to carry a guidebook, well, you've got your phone with you probably, or your Kindle, and um, you you can have uh, all of the information of the guidebook right there on your screen. So that's another great way to um, uh, to get that information. Well, one of the last questions I always ask, is there anything else you'd like to share with the audience that I haven't asked you? Yes, I want to say, if you are interested in taking a pilgrimage walk, don't be afraid. And I recommend everybody's first pilgrimage actually beyond the Camino Frances. There's so much infrastructure. There's so many people to help. There's so much support and knowledge of that walk. And also, it's a... Um, it's a sort of a liturgy in a way of different things that happen to you at different times, like the Cruce de Ferro, where you leave a stone and so on. So don't be afraid. Do a popular walk so you get to see what it's actually like, um, you know, in a well-developed infrastructure. And then relax and enjoy yourself. Do make sure that you train some in advance because your first week or so will be better if you have. And then uh, the best advice I've ever heard, take care of your feet. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm sure our friend Blister John, who we walked a couple uh, pilgrimages with, would appreciate that advice. Blister John. Blister <laughs> Very John. good. So... I'd like to thank you very much, uh, the Reverend Sandy Brown, for this wonderful interview. It was excellent. So thank you very much. I know you made the time of in the middle of a pilgrimage and of, in Europe to talk to us. Okay, well, thank you very much for your time. Grazie e arrivederci. Uh, grazie a lei. <laughs>